In this tutorial, we're going to cover rockets, space, and how to exploit it as best as you possibly can. Now, the first thing you're going to do to exploit space is, well, map all the planets. Once you've mapped, you don't have to map all of them, but at least the closest ones, you can then send your rockets there. First rocket type you're going to get is steam. Steam is objectively terrible. It's the worst of the lot of them, and the only real purpose of steam is to force you to build it so you can actually do the research to get into the better rockets. Uh, it is possible to actually send a steam rocket to return with cargo, but even to do that, you'd still need to do some research first to get the solid fuel thruster, which is also pretty terrible. You're better off just using the steam rockets to get enough research to get into petroleum rockets. Petroleum rockets are the only thing that's going to get you, well, they're the decent workhorses of space, and you need to get your hands on them very quickly. So for that reason, I recommend this rocket configuration. You're going to want to stick six science research modules onto a steam rocket and just have a command capsule on top and that's it then you're going to want to fill the steam engine with 719 kilos of steam the reason you want 719 kilos of steam is because of this exact weight configuration if we pop in here you'll see that we can hit exactly 10,009 kilometers this will allow us to access the first two planets now Firstly, you'll see there is these uh, five research options over here. For example, if we look at this one, these ones have not been studied yet, and they have these little 50 points beside them. That means if you send a ship with a research module there, you will get 50 bonus points. You could say send one research module and send the same ship five times to tick off each of those, or as we're going to do, we're going to tick all of them off in one trip. That will gain us 250 points. Now, they're bonus points. The actual research modules themselves will automatically bring back 10 points. Even if the planet's been studied before, or whether the planet's been studied before or not, the research modules will always bring back 10 points. This ensures that if you mess up your research and don't get into the correct rockets fast enough, you can always just keep repeating going out to the same nearby planets to get enough research. However, we want to avoid doing that. So, we're going to research all of these in one fell swoop, and then we're going to do the second planet as well. And we're doing this because we want to get petroleum rockets. Now, if you'll check under research here, a perfect example of rounding errors. I configured the first two rockets to come back with exactly 600 points worth of research. Unfortunately, due to a rounding error, the last point didn't quite stick, meaning I'm stuck at unable to get petroleum rockets. Uh, I would normally have recommended sending only five research modules. That should have been sufficient to get you the 600 research points. But it seems that can mess up if you're unlucky. So, send six research modules, one steam rocket full with 719 kilos of steam. You don't need any more than that. Any more than that is just wasted. You send those to the two nearest planets in your system. And, the, well, celestial objects, whatever you want to call them there will always be two carbon asteroids in the 10,000 kilometer range. So they will always be there, and that will get you enough research to get into petroleum rockets, which is what we really want to get into. Now, I don't say this very often, but I'm going to recommend a ghetto setup for getting your steam engines going. You're only going to fire this engine twice, and then you're going to demolish everything related to it. So all I have done in this instance is I made a box, used a little um, bottle emptier, dumped in about 1,500 kilos of water, turned it into steam with an aqua tuner, and then pumped it out. Only thing to note, use two gas pumps. Using one gas pump to try and fill 719 kilos will take you 440 seconds, roughly, which, that's over two days. It's over two cycles of waiting for one pump to fill it. Once you've done this, we can then immediately get into petroleum rockets, which are far, far, far more efficient. Now, how did I know to put in 719 kilos steam. Well, for that, we have this website here. This website is a, a rocket calculator. It was done up by uh, Tunderlock. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. I want a steam engine, I want to send six research modules, and I want to send them to the closest planet, and it tells you exactly how much fuel you need to send. This is a very handy little tool you should always be configuring your, rocket, your rockets specifically for the planet you're going to. It'll save you a lot of resources, time, and investment. 
For example, if we were to do this same job with a petroleum rocket, it would tell us exactly how much fuel we'd need, how many liquid tanks, how many oxidizer tanks we'd need. But I will get back to more on this later. When putting in your gantries, it's going to feel a little bit weird at first, but uh, what you want to do is line it up so that it turns completely white. That's too close. That will get burnt by the exhaust and then move it back one square. You just move it back one square from where it fits. Perfect. And that's exactly where your gantry needs to be so that you can gain access to the ship. And while simultaneously it won't get incinerated on takeoff. Okay, this is the first petroleum rocket you should probably put together. It has one oxidizer tank, one fuel tank, and it's set up for 569 kilos in each. This gives us exactly enough range to hit the 20 kilometer planet, or 20 20k planet. As you can see, your max range, 20,000. Now, the reason I've configured this rocket with one oxidizer and one fuel tank is the calculator tells me that with this configuration, I can also reach out and get to the 30k planets as well. Now, the reason I want to do this is I need to hit up four planets. Four planets will give me uh, 1,200 research. That 1,200 research will easily allow me to knock out cryofuel and solid cargo. I'm getting solid cargo first, then I'm going to get cryofuel. And once those two researches are done, you've got the bulk of what you really need to do space effectively. You'll still want to knock these two out afterwards, but there's no rush on those. Now, the reason we want to rush up to this is because we want to actually get cargo haulers running. I'm going to put down a second rocket right here and probably a third over here. They will also be petroleum rockets and I will configure them specifically to hunt for nobidium and fullerene. Now, if you check here on these planets, you'll see these two items down here, isoresin and nobidium. And over here we have fullerene and nobidium. These are not immediately visible. It's not until your research ships reveal these things that you know what's actually there. Uh, what you really want to get your hands on is a small amount of nobidium and a small amount of fullerene. Isoresin we'll get into later, but there's, there's no rush on that one. Now, I'm very lucky here. I have nobidium and fullerene on a 10k asteroid, which is that's very, very lucky. Uh, you might get one, you might get the other, but two on the same asteroid is, is quite unique. Well, once I have seen an instance where nobidium did not show up until the 40k planets, as in there was no nobidium in the 10, 20 or 30k, meaning the only way to get it was to fly it to the 40k. But that is rare. If that happens, you will have to specifically configure a rocket to go out there and get it for you. Thermium is actually made from just five kilos of nobidium. That's all you need to make 100 kilos of thermium and you, by combining it with 95 kilos of tungsten. Tungsten, however, is, uh, I don't want to say rare, I want to say limited. You, you can only find, you can only make tungsten from wolframite, and wolframite is only available in the cold biome on your starting asteroid. Only, you cannot find it in space. It is a non-renewable resource. On my current playthrough, my map didn't have many cold biomes, but I still got about 44 tons of wolframite currently spanked up, and I think I, I converted some already to tungsten. But what you can do here is you can take your five kilos of nobidium, 95 kilos of tungsten, turn it into thermium, you'll get 100 kilos of thermium. Then all you have to do is go back to your basic rock granulator. And if we look here, we'll see there's thermium to nobidium. You can smash up that 100 kilos of thermium you've just made. It'll give you 50 kilos of sand and 50 kilos of nobidium. Effectively, you're taking five kilos of nubidium and turning it into 50 kilos of nubidium, or getting 10 times as much, but you're destroying 95 kilos of tungsten, a non-renewable resource, I will admit, in the process. However, what this basically works out as, if you can get five kilos of nubidium, you can destroy a ton of tungsten to make 10 tons of thermium. So I have 44 tons of wolframite. I could turn that into 44 tons of thermium, assuming I could get my hands on even just five kilos of nobidium. This makes it very efficient. No, nobidium is really easy to get enough of. And for the build we have in mind, we only need about three tons of thermium. So what I'm trying to get across here is usually one mission out to a planet with nobidium is enough to get you the nobidium you need. Now, oh yeah, this is the one map I found where Nobidium was only available on the 40k planets. None of the closer planets actually have it. It's 
completely missing. This is a test map I was running. So you would have to go out to the 40k planets to get it. Uh, you could configure a petroleum rocket with an oxalite uh, oxidizer to get out here, but you'd only be able to bring one cargo wagon. But even at 3%, that's about, yeah, that's still more than enough uh, to, to get you uh, all the nobidium you need. Now, next up, we're going to talk about fullerene. Fullerene is basically super cool. That's what we want to turn it into. You just need one one kilo of fullerene to make a hundred kilos of super coolant. Of course, you're going to need almost 50 kilos of gold and petroleum to combine it with each. So it, it's not cheap. Super coolant is quite expensive. You won't be making lakes of the stuff. However, the fullerene itself, it's not as bad as you think. If you look here, you'll see fullerene in trace amounts. You will only ever find fullerene in trace amounts. Doesn't matter how far you go. You can go to the ends of the planet, will make a difference. You're only going to find it in trace amounts. And that translates to, for every cargo wagon you send there, you will get about 1.3 kilos of fullerene. For this build, we're going to need 300 kilos of uh, super coolant, which means we need about 3 kilos of fullerene. So 3 cargo wagons, making it to uh, a planet that contains uh, trace amounts of fullerene, and we are good to go. One thing I'd like to note is rockets have an exhaust that passes through items. You can't stop it. It doesn't matter what you do. This is a perfect example. This is a petroleum rocket on this side and a hydrogen rocket on this side. And if you'll notice there, I've got a, a little crisscross of insulated tiles versus normal sandstone tiles. And you'll see the way the heat has traveled nine tiles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So yeah, it goes nine tiles down and three tiles wide from the center of the engine. Same for both of them. The petroleum one seems to burn a bit hotter, but both of them have the exact same exhaust size. And if you have them in a vacuum, if you had a complete vacuum here in these tiles, the heat would not even be created. Uh, effectively, it needs some sort of medium for the heat to actually be generated. So if you leave a vacuum in here, nothing will happen, which is perfect. It's what you want. So either insulate it with blocks, if that's not an option, or remove everything entirely so that no heat can be generated and leave a vacuum in that place. This here is a liquid hydrogen rocket configured to go to the furthest planets in the game. It's one hydrogen engine, one liquid oxidizer, two liquid fuel tanks, five research modules, and a command capsule. This ship can make it all the way to the very ends of the star map, all the way to out here to the 1100K. This is the tallest spaceship you should ever need to build. Every single cargo ship, like if I turn this, convert this into a cargo ship, I might have to add an extra fuel tank, but I'd only have two cargo modules, so it would still be two tiles short or two modules shorter. This is 50 tiles high, which means the largest you're ever going to need, where is it, area? So the, the largest you're ever going to want to make anything is about 52. So when I'm building my, or when I'm choosing where to actually place the floor of my rockets in my main playthrough, what I did was I went 52 tiles from the top of the map. So you want to go about, where is it? Right about there. At 52 tiles, you'll still be in the vacuum area, and that means you'll still have plenty of space so your nose won't be actually through the doorway. Just a, a quick idea on where you want to place your, uh, your floor. This is the cargo rocket I am going to use to secure the Thermium and Ovidium. Now, since I'm lucky enough to have them both on the same planet and both of them inside the 10K mark, I can go with quite a small and efficient rocket. This is simply one solid oxidizer, 564 kilos, one liquid petroleum tank, 564 kilos as well. That's it. That's all it takes. And I stuck on two cargo bays. This was the best configuration I could, could make. A uh, piece of advice, always send two cargo wagons. That is just the most efficient way to do it. This will, two runs of this will allow me to in, implement the build we are planning. This is a simple oxalite setup just for making the oxalite you need for your early rockets. It runs on gold and oxygen. Just pipe the oxygen into it. Make sure you've got some gold on hand and it's fairly simple to make quite a lot of oxalite. It doesn't generate a lot of heat. I just stuck in a couple of wheezeworts and made sure the atmospheric pressure in here was above two kilograms of hydrogen. That way the uh, oxalite won't off gas inside here. And then I just store all the oxalite in here until it's necessary. It's very straightforward. Uh, here's a returned rocket. This came back with uh, this much amount of resources. The only thing I really care about is the fullerene and the nobidium at the moment. 
those two kilos of fullerene well basically this both the cargo modules carried back the exact same amount of each because it was to the same planet they went there's enough fullerene in there to make all the super coolant i'm going to need for my build and the amount of nobidium in there i'm actually just running multiple missions so i can get enough thermium to make the to implement the liquid oxygen and hydrogen build you just hit empty storage to dump this stuff on the ground we'll set up conveyor systems later but for the time being there's no need to get complicated this is why we wanted to get our hands on just enough nubidium and fullerene it's to implement this design it produces liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen now firstly the reason we want liquid liquid oxygen so badly is because of the efficiency increase uh, oxalite gives a 100 percent bonus to fuel consumption basically it means the fuel works 100 percent efficient liquid oxygen gives a 30 percent bonus to fuel efficiency meaning we can use 30 percent less fuel since we're using since oxidize oxidize ah, oxidizers and fuel need to be used in the same amount it effectively translates to we use 30 percent less oxygen per rocket launch not only that since we're actually sending less weight we need less fuel so it usually works out at slightly more than a 30 percent decrease in fuel costs using the exact same either petroleum or hydrogen will send 30 percent use 30 percent less oxygen not only that the further you go the more efficient it becomes meaning for the even longer uh, rocket flights you can save up to about 60 percent in oxygen costs this is why liquid oxygen is so important and this is why we wanted to get our hands on these so quickly now this is a standard issue heat deletion device you've got your two uh, you got two thermal aquashooners here because we're running two separate chill ice boxes and these are made out of thermium uh, the reason for this is we're running super coolant through these and that generates an awful lot of heat and this box this uh, this hot box here can get up to well four five hundred even six hundred degrees depending on how how hard you're running it and at what stage in the cycle it's at and these two gas pumps up here are also made of thermium so they're pumping all the the gas back down from the top this whole thing can run up to about i think it's close to about a thousand degrees before you run into any problems uh, the steam turbine itself is just made out of steel uh, works just fine it's right, so, right here yeah here steel so there's no problem this is all you really need in terms of thermium the only other thermium you're using is in these liquid pipes here radiant liquid pipes made of thermium they have the highest conductivity which is why we want them this allows us to dump the cooling into these boxes as quickly as possible so we're just going to concentrate on oxygen for now hydrogen's effectively identical just a slightly different setting now the super coolant comes around here and gets pumped around and what it's cooling down is oxygen we're pumping in one kilo of oxygen a second and when it gets dumped in here it gets chilled down to minus 194 degrees if the temperature in here goes above 194 degrees uh, this liquid pipe thermal sensor will send an automation signal to the aquashooners to turn on and dump more chill into the icebox this will basically turn one kilo of oxygen into a kilo of liquid oxygen every second which is what we want then over here we have this hydro sensor it detects when the pressure in here goes above 450 kilos two reasons for this one liquid oxygen only will form a tile of 500 kilos of oxygen before it eventually becomes two tiles so we don't want it becoming two tiles we'll be decreasing the size of our chill box and that would be a problem and we don't want it going below well too low either because this uh, is pre-chilled oxygen so this acts as a sort of a heat sink so when the oxygen comes in it instantly transforms into liquid oxygen if you didn't have an awful lot of liquid uh, liquid in here to begin with there's a chance it can turn some of the liquid oxygen back into oxygen or the temperature in here will fluctuate too much and you'll have a, a chance of pumping borderline liquid oxygen through the pipes which can result in cracking now one last thing to notice here yes i'm going with a, a much lower temperature than is necessary but uh, this method there's a reason for that when we pump this liquid oxygen out it will be pumped down here and it goes in it goes into these two buffer tanks but there's no actual limiter on this it just keeps pumping out straight away so this liquid oxygen comes down here flows all the way out and these little white little nozzles here they're the actual intake valves on the three rockets i'm currently running so the oxygen comes along and if a rocket lands here it will instantly start getting filled up with liquid oxygen you will only ever have one oxidizer tank on a rocket so all i've done is i've made sure that all my oxidizer tanks are on the bottom level i can extend this if need to be 
So this liquid oxygen just comes out, fills them all up, and then it comes right back around and goes straight back. We're basically running a loop. See, runs out and comes right back in, and then is dumped right back into the icebox. Why are we doing this? Well, this has to do with ceramic piping. We, there's no chance we can afford to produce in a reasonable time frame enough insulated pipes made out of insulation because this requires space material. There's no chance of producing enough of this to run this full length out of insulation. The reason we want to do that is because if you look at this pipe here, you'll see that the contents of the pipe is minus 193.3 degrees. It's quite low to the temperature we want. However, by the time it's done its full rotation and it's coming back in, it's lost two degrees of temperature. Two degrees of the cooling have been lost and it's actually warmed up. But it shouldn't really have done that. These pipes are actually in a vacuum. There's nothing for it to exchange heat with, except it's exchanging heat with the ceramic pipes themselves. Now, if I turn on the temperature overlay here, you see these pipes have turned light blue. In fact, most of them are minus 10, minus 11 degrees. You can look along here. Yeah, they've all been chilled nicely. That's because the liquid, they're exchanging heat with the liquid oxygen itself. So the reason we run this rotation is to stop the pipes from cracking. If we just ran these out and stopped it here at the last uh, oxidizer tank, well, then the liquid oxygen is just going to sit in the pipe, slowly exchange heat with the pipe, and then eventually warm up enough to turn back into gas, at which point it cracks the pipes. I've seen this so many times happen to people. So when that cracks the pipe, liquid oxygen starts escaping out into space, and each one of those bubbles is 10 kilos of oxygen. I don't want to be losing that much oxygen, especially since it's the amount of effort it took to make it. But by just simply rotating it around and around and around and back into the tank, it gets rechilled and spit back out again. We don't have any cracks in the pipes, we don't lose any liquid oxygen, and we don't have to do any repairs. And it just goes round and round and round. Now, there's a few extra things to make sure it works well. To actually utilize these tanks, we need to put in a flow control here on the return valve. The reason for this is, this is limiting it to 8.5 kilos per second. So what's happening is the liquid pump pumps out 10 kilos, but only 8.5 can ever be returned per second. Just make sure this acts as a buffer. We're pumping in one kilo of oxygen a second, so we are actually storing it in these liquid tanks here. And these liquid tanks, we've covered this before, but they're, they're unique. When they're in a vacuum, they do not exchange, the contents of the tank itself will exchange heat with nothing. Not the tank itself, not anything. So you can store, this will, this temperature in here will never change. This gives us an actual buffer system so that when our rockets are away and we don't need to refuel anything, we can store up liquid oxygen for the return. 10 tons of liquid oxygen will fuel an awful lot of rockets. Now, there's one last thing we need to do, and that is when these eventually back up and both these tanks fill, and the whole pipe system is full, we don't want to keep dumping oxygen in here because it will mess up the system. So we've put in one more hydro sensor right here. And this hydro sensor actually has an automation signal linked back to a gas valve. When there's 500 kilos of liquid oxygen in here, this will start moving into this second layer of tiles. This hydro sensor will detect it. And when it does, it will activate the gas shut off and stop the flow of oxygen into the system. At that point, you should have, well, 10 tons of liquid oxygen stored up. So you're pretty good to go at that point anyway. And that's it. That's all it takes to make liquid oxygen and to actually fuel it into your rockets. Liquid hydrogen, absolutely identical, to be honest. Uh, exact same system, exact same fueling method, everything. The only difference is you have to set a, another low temperature on this, a lower temperature just to make liquid hydrogen. Uh, the only other difference is this is good for half a kilo of hydrogen per second. If you need to run more than half a kilo, you'd have to extend this tank on a bit and make it bigger for more thermal exchange. But I wanted to make this compact, and most people are not going to have access to enough water to make half a kilo of oxygen, or more than half a kilo of oxygen per second. So oh, one thing to note about these lower temperatures, the system can actually support it because uh, there's been a change to supercoolant in one of the recent patches. Uh, a thermal aquatuner can no longer cool supercoolant low enough to actually freeze it. If I was to pump supercoolant in here at minus 272 degrees, roughly, it'd still come out at about minus 272. That's as low as the aquatuner can make it go. So you never have to worry about this freezing in the pipes. Well, as of this patch, I don't know if they'll change that in the future. So I like to chill it down more than is necessary so that when the hydrogen flows out of my pipes and does its rotation, 
I've got a little bit of a, a temperature buffer to work with. I don't want the liquid hydrogen uh, turning back into gas in the pipes either. I mean, right now I'm just rotating it around here, but if you'll notice it's coming out at minus 257.8, and it comes back in at minus 257.6. It's lost 0.2 of a degree of cooling just in this tiny bit of a loop, and we haven't even sent it out to the rockets yet. Uh, I don't have enough liquid hydrogen just yet to fuel my hydrogen rockets that I'm going to make. Now, one last thing to note, the uh, rockets here, will, their exhaust will hit these ceramic pipes. It, it doesn't matter. I, I was worried that that would cause an issue at the start. I was trying to run the pipes below the rockets. There, there's no, there's no reason, reason to do that. It will heat up the pipes a little bit, but not enough to actually cause an issue. As long as you keep rotating it, you're fine. Now, another thing you might want to note is uh, I haven't been really emphasizing hydrogen as much as a lot of people would, and that's to do with, well, basically how much hydrogen you're going to get access to. When it comes down to, well, you're going to get most of your oxygen from electrolyzers. That's where it's pretty much all going to come from. And when you use an electrolyzer, as we covered already, it produces 888 grams of oxygen and 122 grams of hydrogen. And because you use both in equal ratios when you're fueling a hydrogen rocket, that means you're only going to be using well, 112 grams of the oxygen for your hydrogen rockets. There is a, a slight caveat to that, of course. Uh, if you look here, these two electrolyzers here are pumping out uh, a kilo of oxygen apiece, and that's going down to my base to keep my duplicates alive. I have 12 duplicates. So those duplicates will be consuming that oxygen, and this will mean I'll have some excess hydrogen produced by these two that I can actually feed into my hydrogen rocket system. I, I'm still only going to be getting about 250 grams of hydrogen, maybe a little bit, maybe 300 tops. So I'm not even going to be getting half a, half a kilo of hydrogen a second. That's not the worst thing in the world. Some people, they will take the excess oxygen they get and they'll just dump it into space and only use hydrogen rockets. I would advise against this. What I would advise you to do is chill all that, chill one kilo of oxygen per second. That's a, a good amount to invest in your rocketry system. Uh, use however much you need to fuel your hydrogen rockets. With my current amount of uh, duplicates and hydrogen production, I'll be able to keep about two hydrogen rockets running constantly. And then with the remaining oxygen, I can run about, oh, let's see, three? Yeah, about three to four petroleum rockets on top of that. Uh, one thing to note, when an astronaut enters into a capsule, they effectively stop existing. Uh, if we look here in consumables, my astronauts are not there. Uh, there's four new ones I'm training up, but uh, three new ones I'm training up. But the, the astronauts, once they're in the capsule, they effectively don't consume oxygen, they don't need to use the bathroom, and they don't consume food. They effectively become part of the machine. They become one with the machine. So if you've been following any of these tutorials so far, you should have, let's see, you should have a good stockpile of petroleum built up. I have lots and lots of petroleum I've been uh, using in my petroleum boiler. So I have plenty of oxygen, uh, plenty of uh, excess petroleum I can use to fuel up all the rockets. So think of the petroleum rockets as close by cargo haulers. You'll use the petroleum ones to run to the nearby planets, usually in the first two to four rings, preferably the first three. Um, and then you'll use your hydrogen rockets for everything beyond that because the hydrogen rockets are far more efficient the further you go out because of the smaller fuel requirements. Use hydrogen for long range missions, use petroleum for close range missions, and you should be able to utilize them all. Okay, an important concept I want to get across here is weight versus uh, efficiency of your engines or how far you can get with the fuel types you've got. Now, for, exa for example here, I used to believe when I first started this up quite naively that if I used one oxidizer tank and three fuel tanks, that would get me X distance because one oxidizer tank can support three fuel tanks. And then I just assumed that if I added a second oxidizer tank and three more fuel tanks, I'd get twice as far. Unfortunately, if you did that, the rocket wouldn't get off the ground. It would just be too heavy. Uh, for a rule of thumb, one oxidizer tank and three fuel tanks is the most you should ever be putting on a rocket, ever. You should never go above that. One oxidizer, three fuel tanks, there's no reason to ever go above that point. In fact, it would be detrimental to the rocket if you did. But to demonstrate that, we've got a hydrogen engine here. We've got one cargo bay, liquid oxygen, because, it, because it's more efficient than oxalite, and we're going to the closest planetary ring. And that only takes 166 litres of fuel to bring back one cargo bay. Now, if we add a second cargo bay, we do not quite double. In fact, it's quite a bit less than double to actually bring back twice as much cargo. So this is a more efficient fuel-wise 
fuel to cargo return ratio wise to send two cargo modules. And this will always be the case. And to hammer that home, we're going to crank this up to three cargo bays. And if you'll notice the fuel here has over doubled. We've increased our return cargo by 50%, but our fuel costs have doubled just to get there. We've gone past that sweet point where the weight we're carrying is becoming a problem. Now, uh, to really hammer this home, I'm gonna throw on a solid fuel thruster. This weighs one ton fully fueled. It takes 400 kilos of oxalide, 400 kilos of iron, and it weighs 200 kilos itself. So it's literally one ton of weight added to the rocket, but it's supposed to provide extra thrust to increase range and it should decrease fuel costs. But if we add it on, it's actually added an extra 100 liters of fuel cost on. We're actually paying more fuel to carry this thruster with us, meaning it's detrimental to the actual usefulness of the rocket. That's because we've gone over that weight limit. Now, so what I want to get across here is two cargo bays. That is usually the most efficient method. And this becomes far more obvious the further you get away from your home system. Now, if we go, and let's drop this to one, if we go all the way to the furthest planet, with one cargo bay, it's 1500 liters. If we bring it up to two cargo bays, it goes up by about 600 or so liters. Basically, it's about a 30% increase in fuel to bring back 100% more cargo. It will always be the case that two cargo bays would be more efficient than one. Now that said, if you don't have the technology, it can be a problem. But if you don't have the technology, you can always just send one cargo wagon, one cargo bay. But if you're sending one cargo bay, it should be for a reason, usually to acquire the materials you need to implement some technology to get you to the point where you can start sending two cargo bays. Now, all that said, the only other thing you'll need to worry about then is research modules. And barring the first two planets, where we've already covered you're going to send six, you should be sending five research modules to every planet, just to knock out all the research immediately. Research modules only weigh 200 kilos. Cargo bays weigh 2,000 kilos. But the difference here is you're trying to avoid reconfiguring them all the time. Uh, every time you reconfigure a ship, you basically have to demolish some parts, and usually you're going to have to demolish the command module, which means you have to get everyone out, and it's... It's time consuming and micro intensive. So what I like to do is configure the ships basically as a one size fits all for certain distances. So for example, here we'll stick on five research modules and we're going to the furthest planet. And with this configuration, one oxidizer, two liquid fuel tanks, command capsule, five research modules, we can get all the way out to the ends of the, the universe. And that will actually do us all the way from 70,000 as well. Is it 60,000? Nope, 60,000 changes. So if everywhere from 70,000 out to 110,000, this rocket will require no reconfiguration. All I will have to do is change how much fuel is in the rocket. That will be it, and that will be done. For 60,000, I would need one less fuel tank to do it. So normally up to 60,000, I would have used a different rocket. So to sum up, use two cargo bays, configure a specialist research ship, and try to avoid reconfiguring your ships too often, and don't put too much weight on them.